I'm going to invite you to the fourth chapter of the book of Matthew. <clears throat> I would like to begin reading in verse 23 and read into the fifth chapter, verse 2. And these verses lay the background for what is called the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew 4, verse 23, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with divers diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with devils, and those which were lunatic, and those that had the palsy, and he healed them. And there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee and from Decapolis, and from Jerusalem, and from Judea, and from beyond Jordan, and seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, The Sermon on the Mount is found in its entirety in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, and partially in Luke 6, verses 20 to 44. Now, the immediate background of Matthew 5 we just read, and we have Christ's preaching and healing, but in chapter 5, we have a lengthy example of what he taught. Now, the Sermon on the Mount begins in Matthew 5, verse 3. And it does not end until Matthew chapter 7, verse 27. And this sermon covers 107 verses and three chapters. Lengthy. Now from the background information that we've read, from Matthew 4, verse 23 to Matthew 5, verse 2, we learn four things. Number one, Jesus is the speaker. Number two, his audience is divided into two parts. His disciples, as well as a great multitude that followed him, and who came to him to be healed of their diseases. Number three, the place where the sermon was delivered was said to be a mountain. And number four, he delivered the sermon from a seated position. I don't know if you've ever stopped to think about the posture of the Son of God. But there are places in Scripture where he sat. Places in Scripture where he walked. Places in Scripture where he stood. But there is a significance to his posture. Now this sermon was delivered from a mountain in a seated position. 
I personally believe that every detail of scripture is significant. So when it says that he was seated, I just have to ask myself, what's the significance of that? Because I realize that every detail in scripture is important. Now, I do not know exactly what mountain that this speech was delivered from. But let me just make you aware of a couple of facts. The King James Version speaks of a mountain. Scholars, however, are quick to point out that the definite article, the, precedes mountain. Thus, a number of translations read the mountain, as with the American Standard Version, the New Revised Standard Version, the New English Translation, etc. Thus, the reference is not to just any mountain, but to the mountain. That is to some well-known mountain in that vicinity. Now we can identify the vicinity because according to Matthew 8 verse 5 with Luke 7 verse 1 when Jesus ended his sermon he came down from the mountain and entered into a city by the name of Capernaum, a well-known city on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee. So the Bible simply focuses upon a specific mountain in that vicinity. And from it, with a seated posture, Jesus delivered this lengthy sermon. Now, a fact often over missed, and I want to—I want to be sure that I that I say this in such a way that you understand. But a fact often missed is that the character, the character of the place mentioned, often supplies the key to the meaning of what is recorded as happening there. How many of you understood that statement? Mm -hmm. I'm gonna say it again. The character of the place mentioned often supplies the key to the meaning of what is recorded as happening there. For example, John the Baptist preached in the wilderness. Matthew 3, verse 1. And the wilderness symbolized the spiritual barrenness and desolation of Israel at the time. Again, when Jesus portrayed the sinner, to whom he came to minister, the sinner was presented as one who went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Luke 10, verse 30. Jerusalem, peace. Jericho, a cursed city. And the mention of those two places is a fit descriptive of what happened and what's recorded as having happened there. A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, not, not only geographically is that true because the elevation of Jerusalem is far above Jericho. Geographically, that's a true statement. But spiritually speaking, a certain man who went down from one place to the other is descriptive of the human race. 
He left a state of peace and went to a cursed place. Again, when Jesus portrayed the sinner to whom he came to minister, the sinner was away from his father and in a far country. And there he was impoverished and feeding on the husks which the swine did eat. Luke 15, verses 12 to 15. Now think just for a minute. We have reference to several places. In the wilderness, down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and in a far country. Now the point is the character of the place supplies the key to the meaning of what is recorded as having occurred there. Thus, in a book that presents Jesus as king, we find him delivering a message related to the laws of his kingdom while seated in an elevated place, a feature symbolic of his throne of authority. So, Details which seem to be insignificant are really not insignificant. How many of you remember that he taught a number of parables seated by the seaside? What's the significance? The sea in the scripture is a symbol of people. Revelation 17, 15. And the troubled sea, that agitated state, is a description of the sinner. In Isaiah 57, 20 and 21. Hence, in these places, a far country, down from Jerusalem to Jericho, by the seaside, etc., they all tell us something as to what happened in those places. Now, with that background in review, we pass on to the primary design in this length of sermon. A hundred plus verses, three chapters. What's the design of that lengthy message? Now you can read it all the way through. And one thing will become important. And that is the primary design of what he said was to refute and correct many of the erroneous views held by his audience. Jesus does this by dividing subject matter into two parts. and setting one over against the other. And we take a lot of things for granted without emphasis. But words obviously have greater meaning and one more easily seen when contrasted to something else. God, Satan, heaven, hell. Light, darkness, rich, poor, strong, weak, young, old, old, sick, truth, lie, good, evil, love, hate, near, far, alive, dead, and on and on and on, the contrast in words goes. And one of the most effective ways to teach is by means of contrast. In this sermon, you have contrasted a number of things. I have highlighted eight things that are set in contrast in this sermon. Number one, Jesus said, he had heard that it hath been said, but I say unto you, 
Notice the contrast. Now he makes that statement in chapter 5, verses 21 to 22, verses 27 to 28, verses 31 to 32, verses 33 to 34, verses 38 to 39, verses 43 to 44. Repeatedly, he says, you have heard that it hath been said by them of old, but I say unto you. A contrast. Now the second thing contrasted in this sermon is two worshipers. One genuine, one hypocritical. Chapter 6, verses 1 to 18. Another thing contrasted in this sermon is two treasures, one earthly, one heavenly. Chapter 6, verses 19 to 21. Another thing contrasted is two eyes, one single, one evil. Chapter 6, verses 22 and 23. Another thing contrasted is two masters, God and mammon. Chapter 6, verse 24. Another thing contrasted is two ways, one broad and one narrow. Chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. Another thing contrasted is two trees, one good and one corrupt. Chapter 7, verses 15 to 20. And another thing contrasted is two foundations. One, the solid rock, and the other, sinking sand. Chapter 7, verse 24 to 27. So just think now. How many things are within this sermon that are brought into contrast? So the truth is divided into two parts. Into two parts. And this sermon sets before us two contrasting sets of values. And that format is found throughout Scripture. Throughout Scripture. When we pass out of Matthew 5, wherein Jesus repeatedly said, Ye have heard that it hath been said by them of old, but I say unto you, and go into chapter 6, we find Jesus dealing with a number of subjects. As with charitable giving, prayer, and fasting. But in dealing with all of those subject matter in chapter 6, he always began with the negative. That is what not to do, and followed it with the positive. That is what to do. Just from chapter 6, I want you to listen to the negative. Verse 1, do not. Verse 2, do not. Verse 3, let not. Verse 7, use not. Verse 8, be not. Verse 16, be not. Verse 18, appear not. Verse 19, lay not up. Verse 24, ye cannot. Verses 25, 31, and 34, take no thought. Throughout that chapter, he begins with the negative and then passes on to the positive. I'll tell you, the great master teacher taught that way. We do well to do the same. But it's important to understand that our responsibility as God's children involves both a positive side as well as a negative side. There are always things to do and things not to do. Now the Bible says, abhor that which is evil. But in the same verse it says, cleave to that which is good. Don't do something, do something. 
Romans 12, verse 9. It says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now listen to it. And be not, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. Be not, but be ye. Positive and negative. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. You know, under the Mosaic law, way back in the Old Testament, you repeatedly read in places, thou shalt not. Thou shalt not. Exodus 20, verse 13, 14, and 15. But not only do you read thou shalt not, you read thou shalt. Deuteronomy 6, verse 5, 7, 8, and 9, etc. So there is a positive side, a negative side, and Jesus uses that format to deliver this great sermon. <laughs> How many of you know that the salvation of the sinner is presented in positive and negative form? To him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of death. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Worketh not, but believeth. A positive and a negative side. All by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. The gift of God, not of works, <clears throat> lest any man should boast. So we have that format in dealing with so much of what God's Word presents. And I'll tell you, it's, it's one of the most effective ways you can teach. Now, Brother Zephon, you were talking this morning about Abraham and Lot. Well, see, not only is it effective sometimes to introduce subject matter, but you can bring two characters into view, and by reason of the study of two characters, you have the same contrast. How about Lazarus and the rich man? How about Mary and Martha? You see there, you're not just talking about doctrine, redemption, and salvation. You're talking about people. And you bring this person into the presence of another person, and by reason of what you can learn, contrast and positive in nature, it teaches a great lesson. It teaches a great lesson. I want to just leave you with this thought. Then we're going to come back, Lord willing, and take up a consideration of some of these negative and positive things that are part of this sermon. When I speak of God's children and alien sinners, an alien sinner is one who's never been born again. He's alienated from the life of God. But when I speak of God's children and, and alien sinners, that language itself divides the human race into two categories with no middle ground. You're either in or you're out. You're either are or you are not. And so in Scripture, you read of those who are said to be of God, set in contrast to those who are said to be not of God. 1 John 4, verse 6. Those of God are the children of God, and those not of God are the children of the devil. And that's the language of 1 John 3, verse 10. 
I don't know how many different words the Bible uses to describe the salvation experience. But there are dozens of words, and they're all different. And the reason why so many words are used is because the condition of the sinner is described variously in God's Word. For one, he's condemned. Now, what's the opposite to condemnation? Justification. He's dead. What's the opposite? Alive. He's far off. What's the opposite? Made nigh. He's in bondage. What's the opposite? Set free. He's filthy. What's the opposite? He's clean. He's cursed. What's the opposite? Blessed. And so you can just run the range of scripture that describe the condition of a sinner and everything given by way of that description of that individual is set in contrast to something that opposes it. I'll tell you this. Justification is to be declared righteous. And I can't be declared righteousness in my own merit. But I am made the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. And the very fact that that righteousness has to be imputed to me is clear indication that I do not, uh, I, I do not measure up that standard in my own merit. It's something that God had to do for me, which he did in the person of Jesus Christ. Just from Genesis all the way to Revelation. And just don't pass over lightly the contrasts, not only in words, not only in subjects, not only in people, but just time and time and time again the Bible involves that poor man. And that's exactly what you have in the Sermon on the Mount. Now, I'm going to close with just reminding you of this. There were two classes of people present. The multitudes and his disciples. It's a big mistake to take what is applicable to his disciples and impose it on the multitudes. Each part must be kept in its own place. And when you do that, the harmonious structure of the scripture reigns supreme. And what so much of the religious world does is take what God requires of his children and impose it on the alien sinner as a means to be saved and last in heaven. But God has a message for both classes of people. And to those in darkness, in bondage, dead in trespasses and sins, there is a particular portion of truth designed of God to get them out of that state. That message is called the gospel of Christ. The gospel is glad times. Everything in this book is not good news. But there is a particular message in this book that's good news. You know why the gospel of Christ is good news? Because it involves what Christ did for you that you could not do for yourself. You could not do for yourself. Condemned and on the road to hell. But God, in his infinite wisdom and mercy, sent his son who entered life by means of a virgin, who was without sin, 
We are some 33 and a half years, so to speak, have displayed his sinlessness. And when he died on the cross, his sacrifice was payment for what God required of me. And that payment is offered as a free gift. And my part is to receive it. There's no merit in receiving it. If I reach in my billfold and I get out a $20 bill and I say, here, I'm going to give this to you. And you, you take it. That's what salvation is. It's to receive the gift of God. And the ways of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Our Lord. All right. Do. Don't do. Do not. Do thou shalt, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt. All through the scripture, this is the format. This is the format. And it's important to keep each part in its place and understand how each part is applicable to you and this audience. I can't look into your heart and know what's there. Nor can you look into mine. But I can simply make known to you that you've never at a time in your life where you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. That's the most important decision you'll ever make. And then once you do that, things begin to change. You know what changes? Your affections. You know why your affections change? Because the love of God shed abroad in your heart. Your affections change. And in that new life in Christ, there is a divine strength that's given that helps you to comply with the responsibility that God would have you to meet. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. May we stand. What's our song this morning? She always says softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. I'll tell you this a lot of people came to Jesus for healing. <clears throat> but if you could clothe and feed the world, what I would call a social gospel, you know what you have in hell? People clothed and fed. But there is a gospel message to keep man out of hell. And that's how the Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Let's sing, brother, buddy. Slowly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. Calling for you and for me. See on the portals he's waiting and watching. Watching for you and for me. Come home. Come home. Mike, how's your wife doing? 
He said, Bobby, she passed away this morning. And that was yesterday. And all I can tell you, that experience is bittersweet. The loss is great. But for one who leaves this life covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, no more cancer. Healthy, happy, and at home at last. And I'm thankful for that. Amen. Don't leave this life outside of the shelter offered in the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Brother Luke Allen, I'm going to ask you if you'll dismiss us, please. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the opportunity that you've given to us to be here and to hear a portion of your word spoken. We thank you for the word that you gave to us. We thank you for the completed work um, by Christ on the cross. We just ask um, that each one will consider the message today and consider it in the aspect of their life. And we just ask that um, many would come to know you today and every day. We just ask that each one of us would go out from this place and return safely and we may worship again in the coming week, Father. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. amen.